God's word with uh, my brothers and sisters. And so I'm just thankful to, to do that this morning. And as we, as we come before the Lord, let's uh, close our eyes in prayers, please. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for, for all things. Lord, you're sovereign over all, and you've brought us here to this moment. Lord, I pray that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit. Lord, give us ears to hear, eyes to see, and hearts to receive. Lord God, as we consider your word, you promise that it will not come back to you empty. And Lord, we trust that. And we pray as we go through this passage, Lord, that it would just fill us with the assurance that, Lord, that only you provide. Lord God, we pray these things in, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I'm going to rely upon the fact that I'm not the only one to have this uh, happen to. But how many of you watched a movie, particularly one where there's a lot of characters in it or sequels, and you kind of miss some of the backstory? I mean, you kind of keep watching it right, but you, you miss the fullness of it. So for me, I was just reminded because I saw one of those trailers for the new Star Wars movie coming out, and a guy pops up in it and it reminds me, oh yeah, when I saw the last one, I spent the whole movie thinking, why is that Professor Snape guy from Harry Potter in this movie, and who is he? Which probably lowered my, your esteem of me even lower. Um, but to get to the end of the movie and to find out who that was, even though you watched it the whole time, you said, okay, I, I, bad guy, stuff's going on, and you can keep watching the movie. But to get to the end and somebody tells you and fills in the picture, you say, oh, I might have watched it a little differently and seen a lot more. So to me, the Apostle Paul is very similar to that. It's because when he writes, he layers one argument on top of the next argument, to the next argument, to the next argument, this, that if we don't always see that backstory, we miss a lot of the sort of beautiful contours that go around. And so we've been preaching through really favorite passages this summer, when we come to this one, so many of us rightly cling to that last part, that nothing can separate us from, from, the, love of, from the love of Christ, right? And we're right to do that. But what we often miss is when Paul says that, he's actually giving that as an answer to a question that he just asked. And when we read on the screen, it's hard to kind of see where that comes about, but he says, what then shall we say to all these things? And many of us might be saying, I didn't realize he asked the question. And even more of us probably are saying, what are the, these things that he's talking about? Right? The, verses, the two verses before that to which Paul lines up all these, all these answers, he puts five different points, one after the other. And many will call that the golden chain. Because very much like a chain, each of these serves as one link that just connects to the other. So let's walk through for a moment. It quickly came up, but it, the first one was, it says, for those he foreknew. Right? And already we're like, oh, big church word up here. I'm not quite sure what that means. But, but we do know. So when we talk about foreknowledge of God. Let's think of what this means. Think of Psalm 139, the one that so many of us love and will regularly rely upon that we are fearfully and wonderfully made? What does David say in there? He says that before I was even formed, you knew me. That all the days of my life were written in your book before any of them came to pass. So that God foreknew us. He knew us by name, each one of us, before, before we came to be. Paul says, for those he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed or shaped into the image of Christ. And of course, we've upped, we've upped the ante on words here because we added a prefix on this time. So what are we talking about when we say predestined? We actually were even talking about this last fall when pastor preached through Ephesians. In Ephesians 1, it said that in love, God predestined us to be adopted as sons and daughters through Christ so that our end point is set before we even make it there. So we know that God, for those he foreknew, 
he predestined. And for those that he predestined, he called. And for any of us who call ourselves Christians, there is that point in our life of which we've been called. That time from before we were not, and then to after we are. And for some of us, that time of being called is really blazed in our mind, right? It's that sort of Paul's on the road, Saul on the road to Damascus, that sort of blinding light. We remember that day. We remember that time. And for many of us also, we can't quite identify that moment because it's been that slow, cumulative, quiet life, having always been brought up. There was still that moment when, but we've been blessed to have been brought up that way. So he called us. And for those he called, he justified. And at least now when we get to words as Lutherans, this should be a familiar word. We say, ah, yeah, we, we say this, this word a lot, justify. But the question is, what do we mean by that? Again, think back to when we went through Ephesians 1. And we talked about right before that part about how he, for, how he predestined us in love. It says that he called us to stand before God, holy and righteous. Now, we're quick to always assume a lot of really good things, but honestly, if I stand here and I say, how does this broken, sinful form, and I'm not alone in this, stand before a holy God, period, and much less holy and blameless? How does that get solved? And we were even singing about it in the prelude this morning, to the washing of the blood of Christ. It's through what Christ has done that he has taken our are the penalty for our sins and borne them. And yet it's more, so much more than just as if I had not sinned. Because getting, being neutral is not a ticket into heaven of neutral people. No, but that we fulfill what God has called us to do. And Christ has done that perfectly. So Christ has taken our punishment and he has lived that life that we should have lived. So for those he called, he justified. Those he justified, he glorified. And we're called even in this life to bring glory to God. But as I said before, in this sinful form, we just, we just don't. We just can't. It's not this side of heaven that we can. It's being in heaven, having shed all of that sinful nature that, oh, then we bring glory to God in the way that we are always called to do. Which is why we, we say, for thinking of our beloved brothers and sisters, even this year, who have gone on to be with the Lord. For David, for Joyce, for, for Dave, for Eric. We say that they have gone in glory. Right? Not to the glory pointed at them, but that, oh, that they are now giving glory to God. Now, if I could ask uh, our ushers, if they would come up and uh, help me. Because God has gifted them in a way that he has not gifted to me. <laughs> the gift of height. Yes, Hank, even you have more height than I do. So since you have stood here, remember, I do not have the gift of height. <laughs> because you have chosen here, we will call you from... Eternity past. Because you've chosen to stand here, it will call you to eternity future. For those he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed into the image of Christ. For those he predestined, he called. For those he called, he justified. For those he justified, he glorified. Paul says, what then shall we say to these things? He says three things. If God is for us, who can be against us? Who can bring a charge or condemn us, who can separate us? If God is for us, who can be against us? Ask yourself, 
Who put this first chain in place, the first link? God, the God of heaven and earth, has put this first link in for you. So no matter who you see, bosses, coworkers, neighbors, that guy who can't stand you, family members, whatever, who can be against us? The Lord of heaven and earth has put this first link in for you. Who can bring a charge? The truth is there are many charges that can be brought. Satan knows quite a few. And it's not that they're not true. But that when they go in before, before God, he says, yes, the defendant is innocent. How can this be? Because God didn't say, it was no big deal, I just, say, I, I just ignore it. He says, no, I heard that charge. And that there has been punishment delivered. But the defendant who has placed his trust in Jesus Christ, Christ is the one who has borne that punishment. So the case is closed. No charge is brought. It has been dealt with. Who then shall separate us from the love of God in Christ? Look back. Now we see the whole chain connected to God from eternity past to eternity to come. That's where we see the thrust of Paul's argument. That we are connected, linked, held in, link by link, held by a chain that God has built. Thank you. I'll relieve you of your... Uh... Thank you for using your gifts for the Lord. You know, the, last, the last conversation I had with, with David Green... It was a beautiful, dusky afternoon, and he sat in a chair, and we were talking about this very passage, this Romans 8, 39. And he was still writing the letter that he had written to all of you, but as he only would, he was continuing to wanting to add to it and add to it, and in talking through this, it says, Paul says, for I am convinced or I am persuaded that neither death nor life, and, and that part, and we were talking about, and he was saying, this is where my, this is where my hope is, it's built upon Christ. And what was true for David is true for all of us. Unless the Lord comes again, all of us will face death. But what's the difference for the Christian? For the Christian and his family? We know that we are connected. We have the assurance of that chain. That God has put all those links in place. That he has kept us there. That he, is, that he will bring us to glory to all eternity to come. And so when we read that promise in John 10 today, how Jesus says that no one can snatch him from my hand, we remember the image of the chain. We are held, strong links. And we have assurance and we trust that no, we will not be snatched, snatched from his hand. But I understand that many of you might say, okay, Scott, I, I get what you're saying in my head. It works together. But have you seen in my life and he says we won't be snatched. That there are so many times, each and every day, that those attempts to snatch happen over and over again. And it's wearying. And yeah, it's true. Those will happen. But let's end this time by going to the very beginning of the whole passage of that Romans 8, 28. It says, for in all things, God works for the good. And if we were to go back to the Greek to look at that, all things, it translates as all things, which still means all things, right? So the ones that we easily identify as the best of things. God, thank you for these mercies, these daily blessings. Lord, even that suppressing of our sin nature, oh, these best things, he works those for the good. And the things that we might look over and say, the worst things, God works those for the good too. Because we need to remember that God is still sovereign over affliction and over the, the evil intent of man. That's what we read this morning in the Genesis 50 passage. That Joseph said, you meant these things for evil, but God meant them for good. And even though God meant it for good, that didn't keep Joseph out of the pit. That didn't keep Joseph out of jail. 
That keep, didn't keep Joseph from getting accused by Potiphar's wife, forgotten about by the baker for all those years after he promised and said, oh yeah, I'll remember and, and tell you once I get out of here. There was still hardship. But God used those things for the good. And even through affliction, God works those things to shape and mold us more like Christ. Was Christ betrayed? Was Christ lied against? He takes these things and he shapes all of us. And in that shaping, it also causes us, our grip on the world, to slowly start to let go. That even sometimes God has to work even, even harder, like Thomas Watson would say, to put us flat on our back so that the only thing that we might see is nothing but heaven. That God uses these things to bring us to himself. Now, if our hope isn't firmly placed upon Christ, it sounds all too easy to the ear to say, well, how is that different from what Mark was saying last week about don't worry, be happy. We're not supposed to just do that. Isn't that, is that a version of? And you're right, if that's all the passage said, that would just be the Christian stamp version of don't worry. We often don't read the last part of the passage, but Paul says, and we know that God works all things to the good for two conditions, for those who love him and then for those who are called according to his purpose. And what does it mean to be loved by God? Who loves God but the one who first has been loved by God, who knows what God the Father has done to send his Son for each of us, as we said, foreknew by name? And who is the one is to be called by God according to his purposes? To be called is to recognize our need for this salvation, to accept this free gift, and to be like the beggar who's found bread, to go and to point to, to another to say, look what I found. I found the source. The source that's ever, that's ever giving, that's firm, never failing, that's connected to the Father, that we have assurance through that chain, that God is indeed good, that he will keep us from eternity past, from eternity to come, that truly nothing will separate us from the love of God in Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. We dare not trust the sweetest frame, but we wholly lean on Jesus' name. Lord God, I pray as we continue to just to ponder this passage that we think about the chain that you have put in place link by link, all you're doing from eternity past, eternity to come. God, that that would just fill us with assurance no matter what comes at us all of our days, no matter how many different ways that we try to be snatched, that we would be reminded, Lord God, that none can be snatched from your hand. God, we just thank you for this grace that you have poured out upon us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll now bring forth our tithes and our offerings.